Shukran Aswani. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's discuss uh, insurance uh, contract. What is insurance uh, contract? What's the definition? An insurance contract is a reciprocal contract. That word again. Reciprocal contract between the insurer and the insured in terms of which the insurer undertakes to pay the insured an amount of money or its equivalent in exchange of payment of a monetary premium should the risk borne by the insurer on behalf of the insured materializes by the happening of an event in which the insured has an interest. What a definition. But uh, this definition captures all the elements of a contract of uh, insurance. For instance, we are introduced to the parties insurer and the uh, insured. So we are saying that the insurer undertakes to pay money. So the insurer undertakes to pay money to the insured. Why is he paying this money? He is paying this money because the insured would have paid what? Premiums. He is paying premiums to the insurer. He is paying premiums uh, because he wants the insurer to bear the risk. So the insurer is transferring risk to the insurer. Okay. Transferring risk to the insurer. So that if the risk materializes, the risk insured against materializes, then the insurance company can pay out the insured. Right. Now, so what, what, what is the essence of insurance? Why insurance? So why effects insurance by contributing to a fund to which other persons who are exposed to the same risk contribute as well? For instance, we are saying that the motorists, all motorists, they are facing a risk, right, accident risk. So many of them will contribute to a fund. Let's say this is Nikos Diamond. They will all contribute million. Let's say um, two million. Right. People who are facing the same risk. Motorists. These are motorists. They are facing the same risk. Right. They contribute to a fund. All of them, they contribute to a fund. And the insurance company knows that people will not claim at the same time. So that's why they take that risk, they accept premiums, and let's say they get four million per term, four million dollars, and they know that per term, uh, they are not going to to be like many people claiming. For instance, in a term, they can get uh, claims worth two hundred thousand. They settle those claims, and the the remaining uh, is their uh, profit. So we are saying people who are exposed to the same risk, they contribute to a fund so that if one of them or some of them, they, maybe they, they, they are unfortunate, risk materializes, accident occurs, then they can always claim from the insurance uh, company. So it's a game of numbers. Right, that's why insurance companies are doing very well. So this is the essence of uh, insurance. Okay, so what are the different types of insurance? Different types of insurance. Number one, there is indemnity insurance. With indemnity uh, insurance, uh, insurer undertakes to make good the damage uh, suffered. So, amount of damages is directly proportional to loss suffered or the amount of insurance where it is less than the loss insured. What are we saying here? We are saying that the amount of insurance cannot exceed the amount of damages uh, incurred. For instance, you are involved in an accident. One is involved in an accident. Right. Involved in an accident and 
the car costs about uh, ten thousand dollars. This is the car, right? Involved in an accident, costs uh, ten thousand dollars to repair, right? We are saying that with indemnity insurance, we want to take the insured back to the position he was before. That means he's given ten thousand dollars. When he's given ten thousand dollars, he's taken back to the position he was. Or let's say this car is a write-off now, but the value is $10,000. It's given $10,000 to buy the same car. So we are saying that he has been indemnified. He has been taken back to the position he was uh, before. Right. So if a person insures this car worth $15,000 and the damage is worth $10,000, he's entitled to $10,000. He cannot claim more than um, his uh, loss. If it was insured only for 8,000, he gets what? The insured uh, value, 8,000, despite the fact that the car is worth 10,000. So you get uh, either the insured value or the damages to your uh, motor vehicle, whichever is uh, less Okay, so what are the examples of uh, indemnity insurance? We can have uh, insurance against the theft of a motor vehicle. Or oh, theft of goods. Right, you can have fire insurance. You can have motor vehicle um, uh, insurance. So these are examples of indemnity insurance. Where we are saying that we can take you back to the position you were before the loss. Then there is non-indemnity insurance. That's number two. Non-indemnity insurance. Loss suffered and amount paid are not proportionate. Okay. For instance, insurer undertakes to pay a fixed amount if the event insured against takes place. For instance, there is a predetermined amount. Examples of this are personal accident claims and life assurance right with life assurance you know exactly that maybe your spouse is going to get a sum of one hundred thousand upon your death it's a predetermined amount and even funeral assurance you know exactly how much you are going to get when uh, someone dies or you know what your estate or your relatives or your children or your spouse is going to get after you have passed on. So this is what non-indemnity insurance. Really with non-indemnity insurance, we cannot take you back to the position you were. It's just money to facilitate maybe your funeral expenses or it's money to, um, to cushion your, your family after your departure. Okay, for instance, personal accident claims. If, for instance, you have been injured, right, and you have lost your arm, even if uh, they pay you a lot of money, 400,000 US dollars, we are not, the insurance company will not take you back to the position you were. But it's just money to uh, make your life uh, uh, better. Okay, but this is non-indemnity insurance. There is a predetermined amount. Okay, like the group life uh, scheme uh, which companies take for their employees. So they fall under non-indemnity uh, insurance. The example which I give there, insurer A agrees with B that he will pay or they will pay $20,000 to B's wife when B dies. Okay, that's the example of non-indemnity insurance. Then number three, we have liability insurance. It insures one's liabilities incurred due to contract delict and other obligations. Ladies and gentlemen, 
we can also be negligent one way or the other as motorists i mean we can we can be negligent we can cause accidents so if we are agreeing that we can also be negligent that that means we have to take liability uh, insurance so many people they take liability insurance because they can be sued by third parties they can be sued even in contract if you are running a big um, company there is need to take insurance even you can breach a contract and you can be sued millions so it's better for you to take liability insurance so that when you are being sued you insure the insurance company can pay the third parties so that's the purpose of liability uh, insurance for instance lawyers we usually we have um, um, liability uh, insurance because we are handling trust funds trust monies right so we take we pay insurance you know fidelity uh, uh, in, in, in insurance so that if a lawyer is uh, tempted you know lawyers don't steal but they are tempted sometimes to <laughs> to take money belonging to to their clients you know so if they are tempted the clients can always claim from that compensation fund and not from the lawyer if the lawyer is nowhere to be found or the lawyer is giving excuses so that the clients can always claim from that uh, fund okay so it's a form of indemnity professional liability insurance and then law society can always deal with the lawyer then number four we have reinsurance what is reinsurance is when an insurance company is insured by another insurance company this is um, when insurance company is also insured okay there are reinsurance companies like zb re like uh, fm re like pao uh, papa re there are many reinsurance companies that insure the insurance company so that if an insurance company is overwhelmed by claims then a reinsurance company can always um, assist but uh, the insurers they do not have a relationship with reinsurance companies they do not know the reinsurance company so they cannot claim directly uh, from the reinsurance because of privity of contract they do not know the insurers so they do not have that uh, relationship what are the essentials of a contract of uh, insurance number one insurable interest two risk three premium four undertaking by the insurer by the insurer to pay a sum of money so these are the essentials of contract of insurance so let's start with insurable interest the insured must have an interest in the non occurrence of it, of the uncertain uh, risk so one must have an interest for one to insure something surely he must have an interest okay you have an interest over your house because if it is destroyed you are the one to who will maybe we have to maybe uh, look for another house to buy okay so you have a financial uh, interest over your property or if it is the life of someone you have an, an insurable interest and unlimited insurable interest over the life of your children over the life of your spouse you have an insurable interest so you must prove that you have an interest over everything that you are insuring right so in indemnity insurance insured must have at least a financial interest 
and interest must still exist at the time of the loss. It's not enough to have an interest at the time of the conclusion of the contract. You must also prove that you still have an interest at the time of the claim. This is the case of Makaura, Makaura versus Northern Assurance Company. Makaura versus Northern Assurance Company. What happened in this case? Makaura owned the consignment of timber. He owned the consignment of timber as an individual. So this timber was insured by Northern Assurance Company. And Makaura was paying the premiums. Right. Then later on, Makaura decided to form a limited liability company. Limited liability company, of which he transferred this timber to this limited liability company. But the mistake that he made is that Makaura continued paying premiums to Northern Assurance Company. But he had transferred the timber to a limited liability company. Remember that a company, uh, a company is a separate legal persona. Right. Is different from Makaura. It's, the, it's another entity. It's a person on its own. Right. So now, this timber was gutted by fire. It was destroyed. So Makaura went to Northern Assurance Company to claim. The, the company, insurance company said, he repudiated the claim. They said at the time of the claim, Makaura had no insurable interest because the timber belonged to the limited liability company. So who are supposed to be uh, to be paying premiums? It is the not it is the limited liability company, not Makaura, because Makaura was no longer the owner at the time of the claim. So he was the owner at the time of the conclusion of the contract, but he was no longer the owner at the time of the claim. So one must prove that he still has an interest at the time of the loss. Think of divorce cases. Where well, one says, okay, I bequeath my property. Let's say it's, it's a will. I bequeath my property to, to my wife. Or he has an insurance policy. Right. Where he says, okay, uh, $10,000, $100,000 is supposed to be paid to my wife. Right. And then they divorce. These people divorce. But the insurance money the insurance policy doesn't change. The, the, maybe the man doesn't change the insurance policy. What happens if, let's say, the ex-husband has died? Does this ex-wife now uh, inherit the insurance uh, money is food for thought. Does he, does she have an interest at the time of the loss? You can find out that. Let's move on. But uh, the bottom line is that one must have an interest. Right. So when it comes to indemnity, insurance. Indemnity insurance, one must have financial interest, but with non-indemnity insurance, a distinction must be drawn between insurance on the life of a spouse on one hand and life of any other person. With a spouse, one has an unlimited, an unlimited um, uh, interest. With children as well, unlimited interest. Maybe with relatives, yes, yeah, one has a, an interest. But when someone is maybe well, if a man wants to insure uh, 
the next uh, next door uh, boy, then the company will the insurance company has to ask what is your relationship? Okay, what is your uh, interest? You cannot just insure a small house. <laughs> you know, it's uh, not allowed at law. You must at least prove your interest. All right, number two, there is risk. One must prove risk. The element, second element is risk. This is the uncertain event insured against. Description of the risk in the contract is very important, right? So that the insurer knows the extent of risk and insurer and insu and, and uh, uh, insured extent of his uh, cover. Okay, so this is the risk insured against. It can be, for instance, fire theft, accident. These are examples of risk. Right. Let's move on. So the description of the risk must include, so you need to describe the risk in the contract. So it must include, number one, the object insured. What is it that is being insured? E.g. It may be a car or a person's life. Number two, the hazard insured against e.g. theft right or it can be uh, accident it can be fire three circumstances affecting the risk e.g. limitation of insurance to theft of a motor vehicle while parked in a locked garage one can try to limit the risk to say we are going to pay only if the car is stolen within the borders of Zimbabwe. Okay. Parties must agree that risk will pass from insurer to the from, from uh, insured to the insurer. And risk must materialize from or due to an uncertain future event which is mentioned in the contract. Right. So come to, to causation again. When the risk is certain, the contract could be a wager or gamble rather than a, an insurance contract. So risk must materialize from an uncertain future event. An, an, an uncertain future event. But when we know that it is going to happen, then it ceases to be a risk or it ceases to be insurance contract. There is a difference between insurance contract and gambling. Okay. With insurance uh, contract, I mean, let's say, one says, okay, if the accident occurs, I'm going to pay a certain amount of money. That's insurance. If your house is gutted by fire, we are going to pay a certain amount of money. If when, when you die, we are going to give your spouse or your dependents $100,000. With gambling, if Zimbabwe wins the World Cup, we will give you $100,000. Dollars. What's the difference? Zimbabwe wins. Soccer World Cup. I'll give you one hundred thousand dollars. Or if race, if if was B wins the race, comes first, then I will give you ten thousand US dollars. If Highlanders beats Dynamos at Papa Fields. I will give you ten thousand dollars. So what's the difference between insurance and gambling? Surely these contracts are the same. They look similar. What, what is the difference? Okay, there are certain uh, differences with Gambling, 
there is no insurable interest. Parties don't have an insurable interest, but they are trying to create an interest out of these circumstances. When the dynamos wins or it loses, I mean, the parties don't have any interest in this uh, event, but they are trying to create an interest in that if maybe Highlanders win, someone is going to get $10,000. They don't have an interest. But with insurance, a party has an interest. For instance, someone's life knows that, okay, when I die, insurance company is going to pay $100,000 and this will be good because my children are going to continue going to school and my family is going to, they, they, they are going to, 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 to have a good life. So one has an interest. Right. So that's the, that's the major difference. One has insurable interest. In, in insurance contract, there is insurable interest. And in gambling, there is no insurable interest. Again, with gambling, one wants to make a profit. But with insurance, no one is supposed to make a profit out of his own loss. Cannot make a profit. Can be taken back to the position you were before, but not make a profit. Right. Now we can um, read about causation because we are saying that if you are insured, if it is fire insurance, you have insured against fire. So it must be the fire that causes, again, element of causation. It must be the fire that causes the, 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 the damage. Oh, fire that causes um, loss. Okay, if you are insured against fire, if you are insured uh, maybe against accident, it must be the accident that causes loss. For you to claim, for you to succeed um, against an insurance company, they must say, okay, it is that insured, it is that uh, insured risk which has caused the loss. So there must be uh, a causation. Right. How about, we are asking ourselves, how about if the risk insured against is caused by involuntary acts? of the insured. Involuntary acts of the insured. Where peril is caused by involuntary act of the insured, insurer is held uh, liable because he does not act. Remember that suicide committed by an insane person. Right? Someone who commits suicide, usually insurance companies don't, don't pay because they would have caused the event insured against. Right? Remember that, okay, someone knows that he's insured or whatever that in takes his life. So insurance company cannot pay for that. But if it is, if it, if this suicide is committed by an insane person who does not understand the nature and consequences of his actions, we say that he has not acted at law. So he's not to be blamed. So he's supposed to be, to pay, insurance company is supposed to pay. Because suicide is committed by an insane person who cannot act. But this is, this is an involuntary act of the insured. So insurance company is still liable to pay. How about negligence? What if you negligently cause the event insured against? You negligently cause an accident. You negligently destroy your own property. Is the insurance company supposed to pay? Yes, insurance company is supposed to pay because one of the reasons why you are taking insurance is because you acknowledge that you can be negligent. So that's why there is liability insurance to cover your misdemeanors. So can one can insurance company can pay. So this is the case of Rukop Tataras versus Incorporated General Insurance. It's in your notes. Where an exclusion
restitution clause provided that policy did not ensure against any loss or damage to money other than in actual transit or contained in a locked safe situated in an office locked. Let me break it down. There is a clause that stated that insurance company will only pay if money is stolen while in a locked safe. In a locked house. Okay. Right. So, or stolen while in transit. So what happened is that this man, the insured, got into a house, in an office, sorry, put the money in the safe, locked the safe, locked even the office where the safe was, but left the keys of the safe on top of the fridge. So the thieves got in, they just took the keys, opened the office, opened the safe, and stole the money. Now, when they claim from the insurance company, insurance company said, no, you were negligent, so we are repudiating the, the claim. They went to court. And the court said that because they, the, the, the company, the insurance company was saying that um, there was an implied term that plaintiff was to take reasonable precautions to safe keep the keys of the safe. So they said that he had breached the term of contract by leaving keys in an accessible place. So it was held that negligence of the insured is not a bar. One cannot be barred from claiming because he's negligent. So they say his duties extend no further than to refrain from intentionally causing the happening of the risk as long as the insurer does not cause, does not intentionally cause the risk insured against. He should be paid. So the insurance company lost the case. They, were, they paid the insurer. How about recklessness? When someone is reckless, right? Recklessness is above negligence. It's beyond negligence. This is the case of Nathan versus Ocean Accident and Guarantee Corporation. In short, this person was, his car was insured. Right. He knew he was insured, but he ignored the traffic officer's order to stop his car. So there was a roadblock and they were stopping his car. He ignored the, the traffic officer's order to stop his car and they started to uh, chase him. So he was pursued by uh, a police officer sounding a siren, right, indicating that he should stop, but he did not. So he collided with a stationary car and he plunged into a bank. Right. So in short, so he came to, so obviously he was arrested and this guy went to the insurance company to have his vehicle repaired. So the insurance company repudiated the claim. Right. Saying that, contending that it did not intend to cover unlawful acts of the insured. Right. But the court, after a full trial, decided that insurer knew that the insured was a bad risk. So this is the guy who had disclosed everything. He told the insurer when he taking insurance policy that he had two convictions right, of drunk and driving. And that his car was highly powered, number two. And he also disclosed that, and, and he, because of that disclosure, he was charged high premiums. So the court decided that insurer entered into the contract with eyes wide open. They made a bet and should lie on it. 
because this guy disclosed that he was a reckless driver, he had two convictions, so the insurer took the risk and they cannot deny to pay. So the insurance company was held liable. Right. Now, let's look at recklessness and negligence. Are they the same? Recklessness and negligence. We are saying, if the conduct is dollars eventualis, I want you to understand this. Conduct is dollars eventualis. Right. Insurer is not liable at all. What is dollars eventualis? Dollars eventualis is when you foresee the possibility of risk insured against occurring. You tell yourself it will never happen. But you have foreseen the possibility of it happening. You tell yourself, ah, no, this will never happen. And it happens. Let me give you an example which I usually give when I'm teaching criminal law. For instance, you are seen. All right, there is a there is a, a, a child who is playing. Right, there is a child who is playing uh, playing soccer, and he, behind. All right, let's say there is okay. There is a there is a child who is playing, but in front of the child, there is a duck. There's a lovely duck right in front of the child. So the child is behind the duck. And you want to shoot the duck. Right. And you foresee a possibility that if you miss the duck, you'll hit the child. And you tell yourself, no, it's not going to happen. I'm a sniper. I'm good. I will not miss. Guess what? You take an aim. You miss the duck and you hit the child. The child dies. Now when you are being sued or when you are being prosecuted, you say, no, but I did not intend to kill the child. I wanted to shoot the duck. Right. Law will say, no, 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 no. But you foresaw the possibility of killing the child should you miss the duck. And you told yourself you were good, you were a sniper. So you foresaw the possibility of a risk for caring, but told yourself that it will never occur, and it did occur. So this is dollars eventualis. Let me link it to insurance. Under the case of Nicolaisen versus permanent. An insured was a prison warder. He pulled uh, the trigger of a revolver under his chin two times. This was a guy who was this is this is a guy who was bored, very bored in prison. You know, nothing was happening. Usually it gets boring in prison there, especially when there is no one who is threatening to 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 escape from unlaw, from lawful custody. You know, so he was poop so bored, he was carrying a revolver, he put it under his chin. And uh, after putting it uh, under his chin, he pulled the trigger for the first time. Nothing happened. You know, when he tried to pull it for the second time, he shot himself and died on the spot. And this guy was insured. And the dependents, they went to the insurance company to claim that this was an accident. He died of an accident. But the insurance company said, no, this was not an accident. This was dollars eventualis. This was a form of intention. So this person killed himself because he foresaw the possibility of death but told himself that he was not going to die. And he died. This man died joking. You know, shame. He died. And the insurance company repudiated the claim because he killed himself. So dollars eventually is a form of intention. So it's like intentionally causing the risk insured against. So he got nothing.
Right. So it's like, I mean, in getting involved in some conduct, you know, you know that if you do something, you're going to contract a deadly disease. Maybe they say HIV, but you tell yourself, no, it will never happen to me, and it happens. So this is what we are talking about. Dollars eventualis. Okay, so it's a form of uh, intention. Right? Then you can read everything there, parity versus meresia, and uh, duty to avert risk happening. Then the third uh, element is premium. You can read uh, premium. It's not um, really uh, difficult. Then number four, another taking by the insurer to pay a sum of money. You can read their principles on payment of money, which are unvalued and unvalued policies. Number two, rights insurers right to repay number three subrogation let me explain subrogation what subrogation is in insurance uh, claims what is subrogation this is a, a principle in insurance law with the purpose of uh, making sure that the insured does not make a profit out of his loss. So with this application, for instance, X negligently causes an accident. Right. He's involved in an accident with Y. Right. X is negligent. Let's say Y's car is damaged. But X <coughs> is insured by Nikos Diamond. It's insured by Nikos Diamond. So, in this case, why the victim here can either claim from X who is the wrongdoer under delict. We discussed delict other day. So he can claim from X because X is the wrong doer. Or he can claim from X's insurer, Nikos Diamond. So he can he must decide whether he wants to sue X in delict or he wants to sue uh, Nikos Diamond. He wants to claim from Nikos Diamond. But he cannot claim from both. Let's say the damage is 10,000. He is supposed to claim $10,000. He cannot claim $10,000 from X and $10,000 from Nikos Diamond and end up with $20,000. Otherwise, you would have made a profit out of his loss. So he must claim either in delete uh, from X or in contract from uh, Nikos Diamond. Usually, they claim from Nikos Diamond. So once they've claimed from Nikos Diamond, Nikos Diamond has paid Y 10,000, then Nikos Diamond steps into the shoes, steps into the shoes of, 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 uh, of, of Y. Right. Steps into the shoes of, of Y and then institutes an action against the wrongdoer. against the wrongdoer. Right. This is where, let's say, Nikos Diamond is the insurer for Y. And X has no insurance at all. So that means Y has claimed from his uh, insurance company. He has claimed from his insurance company and X is not insured. So if Nikos Diamond has paid Y, then Y can, can Nikos Diamond can step into the shoes of X and claim against the wrongdoer Y. Okay, so that Y can pay back the 10,000.
dollars back to Nikos Diamond. So this is the principle of subrogation. Okay? Let me explain it again. Right, so that you understand this principle. X is the wrongdoer uh, involved in an accident with Y. Right. Damage to the motor vehicle is $10,000. And Y is insured by Nikos Diamond. So usually Y will claim from Nikos Diamond his insurance company. And the insurance company will pay this $10,000. After payment, Nikos Diamond will step into the shoes of Y and institutes a delictual action against X who is the wrongdoer. So X will pay Nikos Diamond $10,000. So Nikos Diamond will recover that $10,000 which they've paid to, to Y. That's the principle of subrogation. Then you can read through insuring with several insurers over and under uh, insurance excess clauses that you can read. Then the duty to disclose, you can read uh, everything there up to the end. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.